Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to um, what will be our final business in 2023 webinar. Uh, then we'll turn the calendar and do it all again for business in 2024. Um, but for now, we decided that it would be appropriate this last episode of the year to do a look back. And so I'm delighted that we have two of our two of the members of our labor and employment department here in the Syracuse office um, who took on the challenging task of figuring out what were the biggest developments in 2023 uh, that businesses need to keep in mind um, as we move forward. So I wanna thank you both for, for, for being here today. Uh, so our format is a little different than normal, um, but, um, but I do appreciate it. Just one quick administrative note before, before you guys get started, I wanna note that we will be off next week, uh, the 26th, as well as January 2nd, taking a slight break um, from this webinar that's been going every week for a number of years now. And we will be back at it with renewed energy um, that second week of January, where Gabe Overfield will be here. And he will host uh, an episode that will do more of a look ahead of what we think you should be expecting in 2024. So with that, um, I thank you again, everyone, for being here and turn it over to Pete and Hannah. Thanks, Kristen. I'm going to kick us off. Kathy, can you go to the next slide, please? And one more. All right. So kicking us off is pay transparency. This is one of the more notable legislative changes that we had in 2023. This, the uh, state enacted statewide pay transparency legislation that created a brand new section of the labor law, which is 194B. The pay transparency law is already in effect as of September 17th, so hopefully this is not brand new information for most of us on the line, but if it is, we have the highlights for you today. Um, the law applies to private sector employers with four or more employees. Temporary help firms are excluded from that definition of covered employers. I'm going to make a caveat now that I'm going to explain in just a moment, um, but the proposed regulations, which have not yet become final, also suggest that the law does not apply to governmental agencies. So we're primarily talking about private employers with four or more employees. Now that quick note on temporary help firms, temporary help firms are covered to the extent that they're acting as employers. So when they have their employer hat on and they're directly hiring employees for um, to work within its organization as maybe like a recruiter or a placement specialist or an administrative assistant, and they're directly employing those applicants, they are a covered employer. It's only when they're helping place employees for other employers that they are not covered. Next slide, please. <laughs> it looks like we had some fun effects. All right, so the law requires that when a job promotion tr transfer opportunity or a new job opportunity is advertised, which we'll talk about in just a minute, the posting must include the range of compensation. Now, this is probably where we've gotten the most number of questions, or at least I've gotten a number of different questions on what the range of compensation means. How do we comply with this requirement to include the range of compensation? But at its heart, this is what the pay transparency law is really driving at. It's to make sure that when we have a covered employer and a covered position, which I'll define in just a few minutes, the range of compensation is included in the job advertisement. And the range of compensation is defined as the minimum and maximum annual salary or hourly range of compensation for a job promotion or transfer opportunity that the employer in good faith believes to be accurate at the time of the posting. So we're putting ourselves in the shoes of the employer at the time the position or a job opportunity is posted and asking what in good faith do we believe that we're willing to pay the successful applicant? And that can be a range or it can be a fixed number. So if we have people in the position that we're posting for and we've paid them anywhere from 65 to $75,000, then maybe that's your good faith range that you're willing to pay somebody who's successful. If you're hiring for a entry level position or a position where there is no flexibility in that range, there is no range everyone makes the same hourly rate, then that also satisfies the range of compensation requirement. So for example, if you have a clerk position and everyone who's hired as a clerk makes $20 an hour, there's no room for negotiation, there's no differentiation, then even though it's not a range in the, the way we usually think about a range, 
that would that would satisfy this requirement. One of the most notable pieces that we've seen come from the Department of Labor in terms of guidance on this range of compensation is that the range cannot be open-ended. So you can't post a job advertisement that says that the range of compensation is $50,000 to question mark, question mark, question mark, or $50,000 and up depending on experience. You need to have a range that you believe you would pay the successful applicant. Secondarily, if a job description exists for the position that is being advertised, the job description should be included in that advertisement. So it should be included right in the job posting. The if one exists language comes directly from the statute. So that's directly from 194B. So that seems to contemplate, right, that if a job description does not exist, then it does not need to be included in the job posting. Now we have a little bit of conflict there with the proposed regulations where the Department of Labor has said that a job description must be included. Um, that to me and under my interpretation runs a little bit farther than what the statute itself contemplates, but as a best practice, we should have job descriptions for most of the positions within our organizations. That's a best practice irrespective of the pay transparency law. So if you don't have job descriptions, the strict reading of the statute does not affirmatively require you to create one. It is a best practice. It is something to consider. And if you do have one, that should also be included in the job advertisement. Next slide, please. The law applies to any job promotion or transfer opportunity that will be physically performed, at least in part, within the state. And the proposed regulations, again, give us a little bit more insight here. And they say that when, when the position is only going to require that the successful applicant or employee in the position come to New York very occasionally or in, incidentally, infrequently, then that is not a covered position. And you do not need to comply with the salary transparency law. Um, so, for example, if we have an employee who is going to sit in an office outside of New York, but they have to come to the state for quarterly meetings for a one-day meeting once every few months. That's the kind of um, incidental trip to New York that would not bring the position within the coverage of 194B. The law also applies to any job opportunity that will be physically performed outside of the state, but will report to a supervisor, manager, or office that is within the state. So if the position qualifies under either of those two options, it's a covered position and the range of compensation and job description, if one exists, should be included in the job advertisement. Next slide, please. So finally, what is an advertisement? Right off the bat, really important to note that ad advertisement is defined incredibly broadly. It means to make available to a pool of potential applicants for internal or public viewing, including electronically, a written description of an employment opportunity. So any opportunity for a job, a promotion, or a transfer, whether it's internal or external, regardless of the medium with which it's published, so whether it's in the newspaper or it's on a bulletin board in the coffee room or it's on a job posting site like Indeed or social media or any medium whatsoever, that is an advertisement. And the Department of Labor's guidance clarifies that the pool of potential applicants mean whenever the advertisement or the posting is accessible by more than one person. So we're very, very broad. If it's accessible to more than one person, this is an advertisement and it needs to include both the range of compensation and a job description if one exists. Um, an important note on what positions and what job opportunities the salary transparency law does not apply to it does not apply to direct hire situations. So if you have an employee that you're looking to promote to an open position, they're a stellar employee, they're the perfect person for this job, you're not gonna consider any other applicants, you're just gonna directly approach them and see if they're interested in that opening, then you're not required to comply with the salary transparency law because you're not making the posting available to a pool of potential applicants. Next slide, please. The law does protect prospective employees and applicants, as well as employees against retaliation for exercising their rights under the law. Those who feel that they are, have been um, aggrieved under law or they believe the law has been violated can file a complaint with the Department of Labor. 
The proposed regs do clarify that there is no private right of action. So the Department of Labor is going to be the primary enforcement agency here. And the DOL does have the authority to investigate and can impose civil penalties. Next slide, please. And I'm going to hand it off to Pete to talk to us about religious accommodations. Thanks, Hannah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you. Um, the We wanted to, uh, as we do this update, we thought it was important to uh, touch on this issue. I think we've seen a lot of this um, in the past several years, um, especially with respect to accommodating uh, people's disability conditions during the COVID pandemic, um, both people who felt they couldn't um, uh, work in person and ultimately then people who um, had religious accommodation issues associated with um, the vet. Many folks will recall the Supreme Court dealt with the religious accommodations issue um, this year in a case called uh, Groff v. DeJoy. Um, and um, ultimately what the Supreme Court did is give us a little bit of guidance and, and frankly a new standard for evaluating religious accommodations. Just briefly to review, the plaintiff in this case uh, was an evangelical Christian um, and Sundays uh, was um, you know, a, a Sabbath. Um, according to his sincerely held religious beliefs. He worked for the United States Postal Service, and the United States Postal Service had implemented weekend shifts to do deliveries for Amazon in conjunction with their partnership. So uh, Mr. Groff attempted to avoid working on Sundays in, in light of his sincerely held religious beliefs, but eventually, under the attendance policies, um, it got to the point where you know, he was no longer able to avoid it, and he was um, uh, in a progressive discipline situation, and he had to resign. Um, as a result, um, the, you know, he sued under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which, of course, prohibits religious discrimination and requires accommodation of sincerely held religious beliefs. Remember that um, most of the anti-discrimination provisions uh, contain a non-discrimination provision, an anti-harassment provision, and a non-retaliation provision. Uh, religion and disability um, also have an accommodation obligation. So those two categories of protected uh, status are a little bit special in that they require not only the first three things, but a fourth thing that is accommodation. So ultimately the district court, the trial court in this case, granted summary judgment to the Postal Service and the, um, the Third Circuit, which was the Court of Appeals there, affirmed. Okay, so then we move on to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court changed the analysis for religious accommodations. Um, the prior standard under some longstanding president, precedent was that um, the employer could deny religious accommodation based upon undue hardship as long as the burden of granting the accommodation um, would result in no more than a de minimis cost. And, you know, de minimis cost, when you think about those words, is a fairly low standard, right? If the cost is more than de minimis, then the accommodation is an undue hardship. Um, the court uh, clarified, but, you know, in, in, in so doing, actually really created a new standard. Um, the employer must show um, the burden of granting the accommodation was, would result in substantially increased costs in relation to the particular business. So those words are different, but but they also imply a little higher bar for the employer to get over, right? That you can't, um, de minimis cost is pretty low. Uh, if it costs something, it's probably more than de minimis. Now it's substantially increased cost. So what does that mean? Um, I think it requires a fact-specific, individualized inquiry um, and I, I think that was always the case. Um, that was always our recommendation that, you know, you, you really need to look at what's going on. Whenever you've got an accommodation obligation, um, disability or religion, I think it's implicit that you need to look at um, the individualized uh, facts of the case. Um, but I think it's now the case that the impact on coworkers without more is likely not sufficient to establish an undue hardship. The fact that the coworkers may have to do a little bit more or may be unhappy 
um, that someone is being accommodated. Um, and it's always been the case and remains the case that the goal is always going to be to find um, a reasonable accommodation that's workable for the employee and for the business operation in question. So um, I, I, in, in many ways, this may be a, a case, what, what I sometimes call a case for the lawyers rather than a case uh, for the employers in the sense that you still have a reasonable accommodation obligation. You still need to do a fact-specific inquiry. Um, you need to demonstrate undue hardship. Um, the takeaway here would be that the bar for demonstrating undue hardship has gotten a little bit higher um, and, um, and, and that you need to make sure um, that you're doing that inquiry on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's the update. We haven't seen a lot yet, obviously, under the Groff case. Um, I expect we will continue to see these cases. Um, and we will continue to um, need to do these evaluations on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, with that, um, Kathy, if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to turn it back to, to Hannah for um, a, a topic that I know I've been getting uh, periodic uh, inquiries on, the COVID sick leave and vaccination leave. Thanks, Pete. That's right. It seems this time of year as we head into the thick of winter, we're getting a few more inquiries about COVID sick leave and vaccination leave than we may have over the summer and, you know, through the spring and the fall. Um, this is an area where the substantive law itself has not changed in 2023, but we thought that it would be helpful to remind everyone of where things stand with both of these leave law provisions. Kathy, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so starting first with COVID paid sick leave, this law is still in effect. That means that employees get either five or 14 days of paid COVID sick leave, or pardon me, they get five or 14 days of COVID sick leave, whether or not that time is paid and whether they get five days or 14 days will depend on the size of the employer. Um, so again, no substantive changes to the underlying law itself, but we just wanted to remind everyone that we do still have this law. It is still in effect. The law does not have a sunset date. So that means before it becomes ineffective, before it can be repealed, there needs to be some sort of legislative action. There was a bill proposed that would repeal the law. I checked this morning, that bill is still in committee, so it hasn't gone anywhere, which means again, that we still have to be mindful of the COVID sick leave law and ensure that we're complying with that um, with that law and making sure that we're making that bucket of leave avail available to employees. Next slide, please. On the flip side, COVID vaccination leave is set to expire at the end of this year. So effective December 31st, COVID vaccination leave is going away. The So for the next two weeks, just a quick reminder of what's required under the law. Um, employ, employees are entitled to up to four hours of leave per vaccination, including boosters, again, only for the next two weeks or so. Um, but we wanted just to make sure that we reminded everyone of that. Next slide, please. Okay, so yet another area where we didn't see any substantive change in the underlying law in 2023, and that's the New York State Human Rights Law. However, we did get an updated model sexual harassment policy from the state this year, and we wanted to make sure that we covered this. This is, a, this is an important change. This is the second iteration of the state's model harassment policy. Next slide, please. So if you remember back in 2019, when the human rights law was amended, the state required that employers adopt a harassment prevention policy, and the state actually published its model sexual harassment policy and essentially said that you don't have to adopt our policy word for word, but you need to make sure that all of the essential components of the policy are included in your policy. And that model policy has been our guidepost since 2019. The law that required employers to adopt this policy also said that the Department of Labor is going to revisit the sexual harassment policy that's published by the state every four years. And so this was our first iteration of the state revisiting its policy and updating the, the model form. The model policy is available at this link. These slides, as always, will be available. Um, but I'm going to talk through some of the more notable changes to the policy. And again, our understanding of harassment, of discrimination, of retaliation have not changed. The legal standards that we've been working with since 2019 
are still the governing legal standards, but uh, the policy has changed. Next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. Okay, so one of the most notable changes is that the model policy has a renewed and even stronger emphasis on gender identity discrimination. And the policy goes through some of the, it, it does some, some education, right? So it, it educates employees and employers alike on what is gender identity? What are some different gender identities that people may have? What are some of the ways people identify? And it defines those identities and elaborates a, a bit more than the old policy did. And so we're getting a little bit of insight into maybe some forthcoming enforcement areas um, that the Division of Human Rights is going to focus in. And we're getting insight that this is something that's on the minds of those leading at the division and for employers and employees to be conscious of that as we go into the coming years. The revised policy also has a new section on bystander intervention. Again, this is not new. Your current and former policies probably had at least a note on bystander intervention, but it was probably a lot more sparse than the, up, the updated model policy. So you might have had a provision that said something along the lines of, if you see some, if you see something, say something, or if you have a reason to report, make sure that you do so. And then it might've moved on. But in the new policy, there are examples of ways to be a bystander, ways to intervene. It includes some, um, some methods for interrupting, potentially harassing or uncomfortable behavior. Um, and it goes into this in a lot more depth. Relatedly, there's a much stronger emphasis on supervisory responsibility. We know that supervisors are required to report anything in the workplace that could be running afoul of the human rights law if they see a situation that might be constituting harassment or it might be creating a hostile work environment for employees. They have an obligation to report, and that's emphasized even more in the new policy. So between the new bystander intervention provisions and the emphasis on supervisory responsibilities, we're seeing the division really, really focus in on the expectation that if there is a problem in the workplace, we make sure that employees know how to report it, and we make sure that supervisors understand that they are obligated to report it, and then the employer, of course, take appropriate action with that, that complaint in hand. Interestingly, though this is called the Model Sexual Harassment Prevention Policy, the, the updated policy was also broadened to include references to other forms of harassment and discrimination. And so even though it's the sexual harassment prevention policy, there are references to the other protected characteristics under New York state law. So it references discrimination on the basis of age, disability, race, marital status, familial status, and all of the other protected characteristics that are recognized under the human rights law. Um, so we're seeing just, again, the state really emphasizing all of the protections that employees have in the workplace, making sure that employees are aware that the same harassment prevention that applies with respect to sexual harassment and gender discrimination claims um, applies with equal force to other forms of discrimination and harassment on the basis of other protected characteristics. And then, of course, there's further discussion of New York's broader definition of harassment. So we all know that in 2019, we received a new standard under the human rights law for what constitutes harassment. And that's anything that's more than a petty slight or trivial inconvenience. And in the policy, there's an even more in-depth conversation or explanation about what that standard means. There's a discussion of less well treatment. So the idea that we're treating employees less well than other employees because of their fill in the blank protected characteristic. Again, the real focus is on sexual harassment, but you can sub in sexual um, or sex or gender for any of the protected characteristics under the human rights law. And we have the same standards. Next slide, please, Kathy. Thanks. There's also an ex an expanded explanation of what is retaliation and some additional examples of retaliatory acts. So in addition to the very classic ideas of retaliation, such as discipline or termination, 
um, or a negative performance evaluation. The new policy gives additional examples, including um, bad faith publishing of a personnel file or declining to assign employees to certain projects, um, reporting an employee's immigration status or declining to promote an employee. So we have a little bit more explanation of different kinds of acts that can be uh, retaliation under the law if they're followed by, if they follow protected activity. We have additional harassment examples. And with all of these additions, you'll know I keep saying additional, additional. So the, the, uh, the state didn't really give us anything terribly new, but in a lot of areas, they expanded on what was already there. So needless to say, the already fairly lengthy policy has become even more even more lengthy. Um, I, I don't know if it quite doubled in size, but it's at least four or five pages longer than the first uh, model policy was. So it's, it's quite a robust policy. Um, the model, the revised model also addresses remote work. Given that we had our first model policy published in 2019 before the pandemic in 2020, um, this makes a lot of sense, right? A lot of the remote work problems that we have all now navigated and dealt with and handled were not even things that we thought about or contemplated in 2019 when the first model policy was published. And at its core, the remote work topic is really just to remind everyone that if it could be harassment in the workplace, it can be harassment in a remote work setting or in, an, in a hybrid setting or a completely virtual setting. The model policy also includes reference to the new sexual harassment prevention hotline. This is this was required starting in 2022. So again, hopefully most of us have that in our policies and have had that in our policies even as we went into 2023. And then even though the first model policy emphasized external reporting options, including the Division of Human Rights and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, there's an even greater emphasis in this new policy on the external reporting options available to employees who feel that they have experienced harassment in the workplace. So that was a very quick rundown of all of the changes in the model harassment policy. Like I said, the policy is posted online and available. And as always, we're happy to help address any questions. And I'll turn it back over to Pete. So Hannah, before you, um, before you mute, uh, let me just, uh, we'll clean up a few questions from the chat. Um, Perfect. There, the, I, I think there are several questions about the COVID sick leave and the number of times that somebody can um, utilize COVID sick leave. Um, the the, the um, DOL policy guidance on that is still three. That's still three. Yep. I checked that yesterday. Okay. Um, so that'll be helpful for folks. Um, it may not help if you have new employees, but for people who've been with you since 2020, <laughs> there's a good chance that they've they've used that. The other is you mentioned how lengthy this policy is. Um, we still have the option to use our own policy as long as it includes yes the elements. So you can you can certainly trim down, and I think there is quite a lot of opportunity for doing so for trimming down so that your policy isn't 10, 15 pages long. Um, as long as you hit all of the required contents and you keep with the spirit of the divisions or the, the state's model policy, then yeah, you're not you're not required to adopt the model policy word for word. But you can't exclude entire so you can't just say, well, I don't want to I don't want to include external reporting options. So we're just going to totally strike that whole section. You know, that wouldn't be in keeping with the spirit of the what the law requires. But as long as you have that information available to employees, you can certainly make it more concise. I mean, one of the conundrums for me has always been that if you really want to convey this, um, these important messages to your workforce, um, the length of the policy is actually an impediment to doing that. And, and I don't know whether, you know, the state has, you know, thinks about that or has evaluated that when they're doing this. I mean, we can always add more language, but at some point, the average reader, I think their eyes kind of glaze over. So um, it is a tough one. Obviously, if you adopt this policy, you could say, well, we checked all the boxes. It's your policy. But um, I'm not sure that's actually the best way to uh, affect your and, and hopefully improve and, and, and maintain your workplace culture. That's a great point. It puts a lot of it's a very optimistic outlook that employees are going to sit down and read this <laughs> this whole chapter, this 12 page document on 
on sexual harassment. The last thing I wanted to just um, dialogue a little bit with you on before we move on to this NLRB stuff is um, you had mentioned this new standard, the petty slights and trivial inconveniences and um, and how difficult that is to really assess. Um, my experience has been, I'm not sure uh, all the regulators yet understand uh, where the lines are, um, if in fact they ever will. Um, any comments on, on that point vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the former standard under federal law, the severe and pervasive. Yeah, so that's all that's all correct. I think even though we got this new standard, this petty slights and trivial inconveniences standard back in 2019, and despite the fact that we're, you know, four years out from getting that standard, it, it, it is still very much an unknown. It's still kind of the big question mark in the room whenever we have a complaint of harassment or we're addressing a complaint of harassment. Um, and I share your sense that a lot of our regulators are still really grappling with what rises to that level or what is not quite enough to get there. Um, the one thing we know for certain is that it is a less burdensome standard than the federal standard, severe and pervasive. Um, so we have a pretty considerable gray area where we're trying to figure out, you know, given up, given the facts of our particular case, whether we're above or below the new human rights law standard. Um, so of course, you know, trying to prevent those situations in the, in the, in the first place, you know, is, is the best approach, not always possible, but um, most of our insight continues to come from the New York city human rights law, which has a similar standard, even lower than the state even, um, but uses similar language. So that's where we're getting most of our insight still as the courts start to address these claims. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I apologize to Kristen. I've sort of morphed into presenter and moderator <laughs> here a little bit, but. Well, that's um, okay. I mean, you, you were the original, so you know, it's, it's good to have you back in, in his game. bones. <laughs> you can't help yourself. <laughs> All right, let's uh, Kathy move forward. Okay. So the NLRB, um, and, and uh, obviously, I, I assume most of our audience knows um, that, that um, you know, the National Labor Relations Act governs private sector labor relations. I think it's also pretty relevant to the public sector, um, which is a state law creature in New York. It's the Taylor Law, but a lot of the doctrine that gets a, developed on the NLRB side makes its way uh, in some form or fashion into the public sector uh, labor law as well, at least in terms of how the statute is interpreted and and what we do. And it is important um, to note that, um, uh, you know, even though we think of the NLRA clearly as impacting um, unionized employers, a lot of the developments that we're talking about would apply to the non-union employers um, because they relate to, you know, what rules you can have, what impact they might have on what is the backbone of the act of protected concerted activity. And so it, it's been a big year um, for the NLRB in terms of uh, developments. And we wanted to briefly just touch on those and uh, reprise some of those for you. Uh, the first would be the McLaren McComb decision um, where the NLRB addressed the inclusion of confidentiality and non-disparage, uh, non-disparagement provisions in severance agreements. And the holding there was that broad confidentiality and non-disparagement provision, provisions impermissibly chill Section 7 right. The um, Section 7 of the Act uh, protects employees' rights to engage in protected concerted activity uh, for mutual aid and protection. That is, you know, um, the shortest way to, to, to decipher that is to say, you know, that employees can band together to pursue their rights, you know, unionization, um, you know, speaking with their employer, uh, voicing grievances, so on and so forth. And that right is protected. And the board is saying that including these kinds of provisions that would prevent employees from banding together and talking about these issues, that's the confidentiality, or speaking negatively about things that relate to the employer, that's the non-disparagement, that they violate Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. And um, so what that means is, 
that you're not supposed to have, according to the NLRB, these particular terms in a separation agreement. Um, what, what I think that means practically is this. Number one, we should be um, looking at our agreements, and hopefully you already have. But if your approach has been, as it is for a lot of uh, employers, to take the agreement that we, you know you previously used and maybe one that you know your lawyers um, have have reviewed and blessed off on and then sort of change it to fit a new circumstance we need to make sure that these particular provisions comply with the act um and it's that's going to be a little bit challenging because the board was not uh particularly clear with us as to how that would work um, there is a footnote that says that you could uh, navigate that in the right circumstances, but they, they don't really share with us how you would navigate that. Um, but we have some ideas, obviously. But the point is, don't just take an agreement that you used several years ago and bring it out and, and change the names and change you know, some of the consideration and think that you're going to have um, um, no issues if this is challenged under the National Labor Relations Act. Second point to make here is that not everybody is an employee under the National Labor Relations Act. So supervisors and managers are not covered under the act. Um, there is a theory under which if they are supporting or a witness to um, protected activity that they can't be retaliated against. So that you can't say with um, absolute certainty that under no circumstances would the NLRA affect their settlement agreement or their separation agreement. Um, but be aware that there would be different rules for a rank and file employee versus a supervisor um, or a manager. Um, as I indicated, we do have some ideas about how you could draft an agreement and include these kinds of provisions and create um, language that allows you to satisfy the McLaren McComb decision and still obtain some measure of confidentiality and non disparagement. Um, th there is a possibility that you may say, we don't need that. Um, and, and so that would also address the issue. But if it's important to have it in some fashion, um, and sometimes employees would like it in there because they're looking for mutuality. So there's a lot of ways to. Uh, to address this if if necessary. Um, it is important to note that th th if these provisions are deemed unlawful, they're not going to invalidate uh, the entire agreement. Um, um, and so, you know, th that is, you know, something to uh, take into account um, as well. So let's just um, uh, get this on your radar. It is an, an example of the NLRB really expanding the reach of the decisions uh, which they're issuing. If you think about them as regulating the unionized workforce, I think you're missing um, you're missing part of the picture here because this NLRB, uh, which turns over when the administration in Washington turns over, has a very expansive view of the National Labor Relations Act. Okay, second case I wanted to call to your attention is Lion Elastomers, um, and this involves employee misconduct. Um, in the uh, in the context of exercising their um, protected activity. So, you know, if the employee is engaged in, you know, union activity or advocating on behalf of another employee, and then at the same time um, crosses the line with respect to their conduct is, you know, grossly disrespectful, profane, um, you know, uh, potentially, you know, violent or threatening, you know, at what point do we say that this misconduct, which occurs and is sort of tied up with, intertwined with uh, the protected activity, um, is, um, is subject to discipline and that's permissible as opposed to a violation of the act. So what Lion Elastomers does um, is uh, return to uh, setting specific standards and and for those of you who follow this area, it's very common for the board to go back and forth between various standards. So when we say a return to that, that may mean that it's only been in effect for a little while one way, and we're going back to something that was in effect for a little while. And prior to that, it was the previous thing. And so, uh, but, but here's the current view of the NLRB, that we would look at 
um, the context in which the conduct occurs to determine whether the abusive conduct is severe enough to lose the protection of the act if it is um, also accompanied by protected activity. And three different categories uh, were identified here in this case. One is if the conduct occurred toward management, we would look at the place of the discussion, the subject matter of the employee's statements, the nature of the outburst, and whether the outburst was caused by the employer's unfair labor practice. And in other words, that more uh, abusive conduct, I think, would be tolerated if um, the circumstances are more egregious in terms of the issue that's being discussed. Um, so this is definitely not an absolute standard. It's sort of a sliding uh, standard. And of course, then there's three different rules here. So that's also something to keep into uh, keep in mind. Second category is contact uh, conduct on social media, and the test there would be the totality of the circumstances. And the third is picket line misconduct. You know whether under all the circumstances, non-strikers reasonably would have been coerced or intimidated by misconduct on a picket line. And so um, this is going to be, I think, somewhat complicated, right? Because, you know, you're going to have to look at the different contexts and then decide which of these three standards applies. Um, but um, uh, this is what the board is telling us um, will we'll be done. So we'll have to do an analysis um, as we get there. Okay, third case that I wanted to call to your attention was the Stericycle case. Um, this is a new legal standard to determine when the employer work rules violate the National Labor Relations Act. For those of you who've been following this issue over the years, this typically relates to what's in your handbook um, or what's in your you know, uh, rules, if you will, of misconduct rules, um, and whether or not those rules, particularly rules that relate to um, civility um, and um, you know, trying to you know, act in a, in a manner that's professional in the workplace, whether those rules have a reasonable tendency to chill employee rights under the NLRA. And this is sort of back to, you know, the last case that I was just talking about that, you know, people sometimes get heated when um, discussing uh, labor matters and workplace matters and, you know, things that may relate to the terms and conditions of employment. And so this is an inquiry about whether those rules would violate the National Labor Relations Act because they chill in and of themselves, irrespective of the actual conduct, um, whether well, those rules tend to chill people from exercising um, their, their right to engage in this protected activity. So the, 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 this is straight burden shifting that has been implemented by the board. The general counsel has um, the burden to establish that the work rules have a reasonable tendency to chill employee rights. I think that's going to be fairly easy to establish under the new the stericycle matter, uh, case law. So then the employer must rebut that presumption by establishing that the rule advances a legitimate and substantial business interest. That part will be easy, um, but the second part is going to be really hard, that the employer cannot advance the interest with a more narrowly tailored rule. In other words, if you set it differently, you couldn't achieve that interest. That is going to be very very difficult for an employer to satisfy. Okay, so increased scrutiny of our policies, work rules that could chill the NL NLRA must be um, narrowly tailored. Um, and some of the policies that you're going to want to take a look at are, you know, your social media, your dress codes, you know, recording, use of electronic communications, all those sorts of things could be under scrutiny here. All right, so the last thing I wanted to, um, to touch on here is the CMEX construction case. This is a significant change to the unionization process. If it is sustained um, through the appellate courts, um, it's gonna be a dramatic change in how um, unions organize and when employers may have an obligation to recognize a union. What the board said here is that if the union demands recognition and the employer does not petition the board for an election, um, within a, a two-week period that um, that there could be recognition based upon the cards in question. And so this really puts the onus on the employer 
to file for an election, demand an election, um, or potentially end up with a union. Um, the second thing, though, and so the secret ballot election is being minimized here um, unless the employer requests that secret ballot election. Um, the second thing is, and, and by the way, unions can still request an election, so they, they don't have to go through the card process, but this is another avenue um, that would put the onus on the employer to act. But the second thing is um, an employer uh, faces significantly increased risk of a bargaining order um, without the union winning an election, in some scenarios without an election being held at all, because the CMEX case has changed or indicated a change in when an, an employer unfair labor practice would uh, result in a um, bargaining order, even in the absence of an election. And so this case is extremely significant. When you couple this case with Stericycle, which says you might have unlawful rules, it is possible that those unlawful rules could be used to argue that you have to recognize the union based upon a card majority. So um, bottom line here is if you are subject to a union organizing uh, campaign and you want to have a secret ballot election so that your employees are able to uh, vote um, their conscience after potentially being, um, you know, receiving some education about the process, you need to be aware of this and to act quickly. Okay. Um, that was quick and I apologize for the speed. I were a little bit over. I'm going to turn it back to Kristen here. Well, thank you both for that comprehensive overview of, uh, you know, the, the big things that happened this year. The Q&A was very active today. Um, thanks for being so engaged, everyone. Did my best to try to answer a number of them. Didn't get to all your questions uh, because there are a lot, um, but I uh, do appreciate you uh, being here and engaging with us and hope that you continue to join us into next year. Um, so thank you very much.